Good to go. Good afternoon and good morning to some folks who are actually joining us from literally 12 hours difference in a time zone. Um, my name is Bonnie Stewart. I'm uh, an assistant professor of online pedagogy and workplace learning at the University of Windsor. And I am delighted to invite you and welcome you to remote teaching. Um, S-E-E, -E, simple, equitable, engaging for high school educators. Um, we are uh, working towards sort of having afternoon coffee hour sessions and um, what I'm going to do is just begin sharing my screen while the other folks on the call um, take a chance to say hello and who they are as well. I will grab the beach ball first and then I will pass the beach ball to the next person when I'm done. So my name is Dave Cormier. I'm a learning specialist at the University of Windsor and uh, I'm here in Windsor. So I will pass the ball to David. Uh, hello, I, my name is David Petro. Um, I'm a former uh, math and science coordinator for the Windsor Essex Catholic District School Board. Uh, and now I am a vice principal of Corpus Christi Middle School and Brennan High School in Windsor. Thanks, David. Who are you passing the ball to? Oh, uh, Sandra. Oh, hi, I'm Sandra Chow. Uh, I'm director of innovative and Digi digital learning at a private bilingual school in Beijing, China. Uh, but I'm uh, born and raised in Canada and uh, did all my most of my 18 years of teaching in Ontario. And I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today, but Sandra is literally awake at 2 a.m. to do this, so maybe special shout out. Sandra, thank you so much, because you are further <laughs> ahead on the arc of, of remote teaching than we are. You've been um, under kind of social isolation lockdown for longer than we have, so you're going to speak to us from the future. And Bam. Um. Hi, uh, thanks, thanks for, for hosting and for having us. I am a secondary teacher in the Toronto District School Board. I've been in the board for a decade now. I've uh, also completed my uh, doctoral work at the University of Toronto in the Department of Geography, but my research was concerned about the relationship between educational inequality and e-learning and um, I'm hoping to return to research um, on a leave next year. So the balance that I strike between my practice and my research is a really, um, a really important one. And so lots of wisdom to share from within this group. Um, basically, like I said, this is in a sense a coffee hour for folks to get together and talk about experiences. Our key focus and framework is really this idea is meant to be a bit of a mission statement. As we're teaching right now, as we're designing our teaching, let's try to think about ways to keep it as simple as possible. Part of doing that also enables us to keep it as equitable as possible. And because we do want to keep families and students on board with the whole project of learning during this time, keeping things as engaging as possible. Um, this has been useful to me as a setup for thinking about remote instruction. I've spent 20 years in online learning. What we are all doing right now is not what I think of as online learning. It's very much like the difference between saying, hey Bonnie, let's have 20 people over in six months and we're gonna plan this wonderful whole smorgasbord of things versus, oh my goodness, look on your front porch, you've now gotta feed everybody with whatever's there. And that is very much the arc that I'm seeing my own kids, teachers on and doing an amazing job on that learning curve of figuring out how to make, you know, peanut butter and jam sandwiches for 20 people. Um, but the key is always, in my mind, starting by paring it down. Sometimes we think about education as the content that we're putting out there. And to an extent, we're going to have to pull back from that in order to make the whole remote teaching experiment a successful one for learners. Um, this is an example just of my syllabus for one of my digital tech and social media courses that I taught this past year. I went from teaching, I moved to Ontario about 20 months ago now, and I went from teaching in a Bachelor of Ed program where students took five courses at once, 
to a bachelor of ed program that was differently structured where students took 10 courses at once. The cognitive load on those students is simply different, even if the credit number of hours is the same. And I had to drastically take my syllabus and all those precious things that I had designed that I thought were so important to cover and go, <laughs> here we go. We're getting rid of this. Nope, we're getting rid of this. Do you know what? First year, I only, I only paired it a bit. Second year, I managed to really take a good, good sort of swath of things out. I actually felt like the course went better. There was a piece where I had to give myself permission. Beyond that, we were good. Um, so the team for session three, um, we have Behan, then David, and then Sandra to share with us. And I'm gonna let Behan take the mic now and go ahead. Thank you. I have. I, I am timing myself, so I'll be mindful. Uh, I'm starting uh, by offering three tips that I hope will add to the already great suggestions that were provided in the previous sessions. Uh, and those three tips are to communicate boundaries explicitly to students, uh, to manage expectations, uh, by which I'm referring to the contradictory ideas uh, that teachers, students, parents, and administrators sometimes have about emergency remote teaching. Um, and then three, to establish routine, which I think is the key to successful planning. So the next slide. Uh, so the first is to communicate boundaries. Uh, educators are under uh, varying degrees of external pressure. So in addition to COVID-19, we have different ways of coping with our anxieties. And that might look like highly regimented routines to what is increasingly becoming a part of my life, hiding under the covers. Um, but face-to-face, -face, we don't have to tell students when we are going to be available. Uh, the, fa the discipline of space and time are, are highly regimented. We receive fewer emails from colleagues, students, and parents during the school day. Um, and so we can't assume that everybody's operating under predictable schedules. So for this reason, uh, post uh, it's a good idea to post when you will be available to correspond, as well as what tools you would like students to use uh, to communicate. That might look like email, but in my instance, I want students to use the platform that we're engaging with, which is desire to learn. You might, uh, if, you, if you get a lot of emails about feedback, you might consider asking students to wait 24 hours before um, they ask you about an evaluation. If you're using Google Meet, uh, please make it clear that uh, students should disable video before entering. So these are sort of, these are examples of the kinds of boundaries that you might strike. Uh, depending on the platform you use, it will, it will look different. Um, I, you know, I think it's been mentioned before too that it's highly recommended to record the sessions because you can't assume that students can attend since we're all operating on different schedules. And uh, uh, lastly is sort of um, taking care to explicitly talk about the etiquette of using any synchronous meetings just the way that you know, it was done at the beginning of the meeting, including how to engage through status changes and chat functions. Um, and so there aren't really, I think what I'm trying to hit home with this is there aren't norms around how uh, we communicate during this time and we need to make those uh, really explicit so there aren't uh, barriers to online instruction. So the next one is managing expectations. Face-to-face uh, -face classes are understood to be the great equalizer because they prov provide uh, access to sa a safe learning environment, uh, peer and community supports as well as unparalleled tools for accessing um, you know, different, you know, techniques for differentiated instruction. It's, it's not perfect, it is the best resource we have. Uh, but the logic of teaching face-to-face, -face, which is what most of us know, is not um, the logic of teaching online. And the benefits of teaching online, in fact, are marketed as you know, anytime, anywhere. And so really it's, it's intended to work around the schedule of the student. Um, and if you are part of like part of managing expectations, uh, especially during a pandemic, is aligning what you expect uh, with the logic of learning online, and especially during an emergency, and then communicating that clearly to to parents and students. And so, in my class, which is the what is pictured here, I had sent out a letter um, on the right hand side, and I sent it by email, and I posted it in the platform. 
and I had let them know what they can expect with hyperlinks to board communication and ministry uh, communication, some of which students don't uh, have access to. I also provided a video because one of the uh, challenges of online learning is sometimes in an inundation with lots of text. So I provided a video that went through everything as well. And what happened was like, if I had a parent message me about what the expectations were, I would just send them a link to the letter. Um, and in Ontario, we have an expectation of 1.5 hours a week for a non-semester class and three hours for a semester class. So I think that's a really important component to keep uh, you know, to keep at the forefront, um, as Bonnie mentioned, to cut down and to ensure that students know that we're going at a, you know, at a fraction of the pace that they might ex expect in a face-to-face -face classroom. And this, this sort of allows uh, that, you know, alignment with expectations. And, you know, the most important thing, of course, with online instruction is just to con continually repeat these expectations. I have to let students know, especially those uh, who have like deadline anxieties that are baked into their relationship learning, uh, that it's okay to center their wellness, that these deadlines are just to manage um, their own um, for like self-management. It's not prescription and it's flexible. So I have to keep repeating that um, because I, I have a sort of soft due date, but it's, it's not uh, enforced. And so here's an example of uh, what a, what I, what my work would look like prior to the, um, to remote instruction. And so he, on the left hand side, this is an example of a semester school. Uh, I'm an, I'm an English teacher and I had an assignment where I would ask students to learn about the different kinds of paragraphs. So, you know, descriptive and expository and persuasive. So I asked them to take, uh, to, to write, um, the same topic with, you know, using a uh, descriptive, in a descriptive paragraph and an expository paragraph, but they had never learned this before. So, you know, in the, in the breakdown on the left-hand side, it actually includes me d like teaching this to them, uh, having them practice as a whole group, which might look like adjusting, um, how do we adjust for tone in our, um, in our paragraphs, uh, and, and finally going through, you know, feedback and then, another draft and then feedback and so on. On the right hand side, I, in order to sort of keep it simple and equitable, I'm not teaching anything new. Um, and because I'm not making the assumption that students are prepared to learn anything new, nor am I making the assumption that all students can access um, the instruction. So I am just reviewing, I'm asking them to pick either a descriptive or expository paragraph and apply it to something that they're experiencing right now, whether it's you know explaining in an expository paragraph how to bake a cake or writing a description of their routine. And so connecting it to their own experience is really important. And lastly is the exemplar I have of a one week routine. Um, and this is uh, just an example, but it's really helpful to have a sense of predictability and social presence online. And so on Friday, I provide um, a breakdown of what the work is gonna look like next week. I provide a screencast to visually, um, you know, to provide a visual of that. And then Monday to Wednesday, I, I um, arrange a synchronous session that's optional and recorded that isn't intended to replace that asynchronous component. And on Thursday, I have a sort of like pre pre set up, uh, to, like I don't even need to be online. I just like have a pre-scheduled night owls post that has to do with just wellness um, and mindfulness. That's lovely. I love that you have the hyperlinks included because one of the biggest challenges I'm finding just in terms of navigating um, the home learning that, that we're seeing is sometimes the many, many steps that it takes to get from A to B. A hyperlink and almost any platform that you're using, educators will let you include one. Take the time to learn to put one in because it does help people get there directly. David, what about you? Hey, what about me? Um, so first of all, uh, I just tossed in the chat, uh, the link on the top there, the bit.ly link that any, any of the links that I put in these slides, I've added to that Google, uh, doc so that you can click on them directly and try them out. Um, I first want, you know, I first started teaching in the online environment, uh, probably in 2006 is when I first wrote my first online course for a grade 12 math course. And I think right out the gate, um, found that I was, uh, it felt like I was teaching in, in isolation a lot. Uh, I often 
would put things out there and sometimes wouldn't hear back from my students. Uh, and it really was, it's a very different environment than what we're used to in the face-to-face -face class. And I, and I think we're all now thrown in that environment. And so whatever we can do to uh, help uh, lessen that isolation is gonna be helpful to us. And so one thing that I would like to encourage you to try to do if you're not doing it already is find uh, an online community that resonates with you. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit from the lens of math because that's sort of where I reside a lot in, but there are many online communities that exist like this. And I, I have to tell you that, that um, Twitter has become one of my best professional development tools that I've, I've, I've had since maybe 2009. And so to help you, uh, I've actually given a talk on this and you can see there's a link to the talk down there where I've sort of focused in on uh, some of the things that I do to help hashtags to follow what that means, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter ha handles to follow, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's the slide deck that actually has all the hot links in there as well. Uh, and then if you really want, uh, there's a podcast where I talk about it as well on the Making Math Moments podcast. And so these things, these, these tips here are ways that you can sort of move beyond just watching what's going online uh, to actually being part of that community, whether it's start by liking stuff, then by retweeting, then by making a comment and then that, that, that actually tweeting out and, and sharing stuff on your own. And I can't, again, I cannot stress enough how important this was for my own development and the communities uh, that I've, I've sort of started as online communities and the people I've met from all over North America. Uh, so again, I encourage you to do that. The next thing I wanna talk about is the idea of making things visual. Now, I think this is a good practice to have in any classroom, face-to-face -face or online, but I think more so online now, uh, our, our weaker students are going to need this. Our better students are gonna do fine online. They will do fine despite whatever monkey we put in front of them. Uh, you know, we, it's those weaker students that we really have to focus our attention to. Because if we, if we can service them, we're gonna service all our students. And so whatever you can do to make things visual, I, I really strongly suggest that. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and here's one really quick uh, and fun way that you could do that. A friend of mine from, from Nashville started doing this where he just added these uh, memes to his uh, slideshows. So just something in between all the, all the content uh, to comment on it. It's just something that you could add to, uh, to the stuff that you're already doing. Uh, let's move on. In the math, uh, in the math field, uh, uh, a piece of software that really does make things visual is a, a, a software package called Desmos. Um, I strongly suggest this for any math teacher in secondary. Um, and one of the things that, I, that I've done, I mean, it started out as a graphing calculator, but it's actually way more than that now. It, it incorporates lots of activities and very, very uh, uh, well thought out uh, pedag pedagogical uh, uh, things that they've done in those activities. Uh, they have a teaching team that focuses on that extensively. And uh, with their teacher dashboard in the activities, you can actually watch what students are doing at distance and comment uh, on them as they're doing that. And one of the things that I've done, there's a link at the bottom there that I've included. I've actually taken uh, uh, about 40 pages of Desmos activities and linked them directly to Ontario Math Curriculum for grades seven to 12. So if you've got no any math teachers, you might wanna send them that link. And we can go to one more slide there. Uh, the, the latest thing that they've done is they've had this, this feature where you can comment on individual slides of individual students work in real time while they're um, while they're actually working on it and so I've got some links there as to how you can deal with that now my last thing if you want to go to the next slide thank you is um, I think many of us as teachers have you know, we, we love that feeling of, you know, being in front of the classroom, interacting with our students, standing next to our students at the blackboard, at the whiteboard, working with them. And that's something that we have lost. But we can get that back digitally at distance using uh, an online whiteboard, whether it be Jamboard, Bitpaper IO, or Whiteboard FI. These are things that you can do where it's a collaborative whiteboard that you can share with as many people as you want. You can write on it they can write on it, you can um, both be collaborating or, or you know, groups of you can be collaborating on the same document uh, at one time. And uh, one uh, 
tip I'm going to try to do here. I don't know, Bonnie, if you can click on the try this link and we'll uh, bop to the, uh, the screen. We'll give it a shot. We're going to give it a shot. I like that. I like that. So this is just a sample uh, Jamboard that uh, looks like it's coming up, I hope. Um, uh, yeah, it's up for me. Oh, there it is. Okay, I see there it. There you go. Um, and so I actually have this up on my phone at the same time. And so I'm actually, I can actually write on my phone um, and uh, like I would uh, with a pen or a finger. And my, my big tip here is when I write on my phone, I'm gonna hold this up, uh, I zoom in to the area that I wanna write on and it's just like writing on paper. And so I can be writing in real time, I can collaborate with a few more students, give them right access to this and we can be writing on that as well. I put a link to this in my document, so anyone that has that link can try it. Um, I don't recommend uh, more than three or four people in general being on one of these things at once, just like you would a Google Doc, but feel free to go ahead and, and try that out and uh, see what you think. Okay, Thanks thank you, that's awesome. And different platforms do have different kinds of availability there in terms of, um, like we use Blackboard Collaborate at the university and there are those live slides built right in, but if you need to go out, those suggestions that you gave are really, really helpful to folks. Sandra, we're gonna turn around to you and um, you're gonna talk to us from the future. That's right. Um, so uh, we are in our 11th week of being remote and so I'm just gonna share some uh, pitfalls. Next slide. Um, that I think that um, many of our um, our teachers and our leaders have learned mm -hmm. through this process, as well as some do's that um, I think are important to remember. So one of the pitfalls that we see a lot of teachers doing is they lose sight of their main purpose, and that's our students. Um, many times we have all these other things that we try to meet and try to manage, and really when it comes down to it, it's our students that are most important. So remember that. Next slide. Um, the other thing that um, uh, teachers often lose sight of is time. Um, they might imagine something taking a certain amount of time, but um, they, they lose sight that when you're actually doing the activity, thinking about the activity, uploading it in our very, very busy internet, um, everything instead of taking three minutes actually takes two hours and a, a video that you plan to have taken three minutes to create actually takes a long time. Next slide. Um, they also lose sight of the circumstance. Um, we forget that this is a very stressful time and I put the life skills event scale here because there are so many of those things that we can check off as being um, what we're experiencing right now and the fact that we are in this itty bitty space and so even though we think we can do a lot of things we lose sight of the circumstance that we're currently in and we plan too much so next slide um, and they lose sight of good learning practices in that process where we think we um, we we know it's not a good idea to do worksheets in the classroom and we do that online and all of a sudden we think it's okay or um, we don't want to do tests all the time in the classroom and all of a sudden we think mm, we're online and it's okay. So um, don't lose sight of good learning practices. Um, the TPAC model um, is something we want to keep in mind during this process. Um, next slide. Um, so what are some things we want to do? Uh, next slide. I think one of the things we want to remember is to be interactive. And being interactive is not just a talking face and just putting our lessons plan um, line by line. We want to still do, um, in, in, we want to be interactive with our, our students, but they can be really simple. Interactive can just be putting things in the chat and having students write their thoughts in the chat or just creating a slide and, and collaborating on a slide. Next slide. Um, we have to remember that we want to have online and offline activities. We don't have to have everything online. So remember that we need to balance that and um, engagement can look like offline activities like creating papyrus paper or having them create roti and, um, and, and talk about the different kind of um, cultures that students are experiencing, but actually have them cook it with their family. Next slide. 
Um, and use the home as your classroom to make that engaging. Involve the family members. So here's an example of a student um, talking about the chair duet method to convey the idea of contradiction. And, um, um, and another student where they were doing, continuing their music about uh, the sulfage, um, but they used glasses that they had at home to create the sound. Or um, in art, visual arts class, rather than um, just painting, the, the teachers involved the fridge and used fruit carving as an activity to bring in the elements of art. Next slide. And, and use real life examples. This is another example of a teacher um, engaging the whole COVID um, experience and crises where they talked about healthcare workers and how they can actually create all, their own PSAs, um, public self, uh, service announcements using posters. And um, they talked about careers that, this is in Chinese, I apologize, but they talked about careers that, that could have been impacted by this whole crisis and had students do presentations um, online, just as they would in class, about just um, experiences that they were worried about. Next slide. And um, make sure you promote that social connection through all of this. And that can just be through chats. Um, we had, uh, we used teams at our school and, and we had channels and each grade had their own channel where they could just continue that interaction with each other and allow that to happen um, through, through just chats. Next slide. And um, you don't have to stop being creative through all of that. Um, we had um, our Model UN every year and um, our teachers didn't want to give up on that, but they just pared it down a little bit. And we had one um, online session for um, the whole day where the students dressed up, came, they still discussed their um, State of the Union as, as different countries. Um, and it was simpler, but it still worked. And they were still able to try something and continue on with something creative even though it was um, a lot different than what they were used to. Next slide. And um, so it's still possible to be normal. We still had our morning meetings. Our grade nines, grade 12 still do their 10 minute meetings. And um, it's very simple. They talk about, you know, eye health and do eye, eye yoga. Next slide. Or, um, or they, they talk about um, their families and their home life. We have teachers all over the world. They bring in their cats, they bring in um, their pets and their family and just share that with each other. So it's still possible to keep um, some of the things normal, just make it simple. I think that's it. Oh, sorry. And we had service activities that our students are still engaging in. So um, our students raised money for, uh, the people in Wuhan and sent um, a whole bunch of masks to the Wuhan city for healthcare workers. And this is an example of a student who did, just did tutoring with a third grader um, and taught them English. And that continues to be something that is normal. We had service learning before and we still have service learning now, we just do it in a simpler way. That's amazing. This is such a rich collection. Thank you so much, panelists, for all these hands-on examples of what you're doing and what people can do that all do focus down to that framework of, of making things both simple but also meaningful. Um, I really, really appreciate it, and I'm amazed at, and appreciative of you keeping that condensed for us. Because I was like, oh, let's try to keep it to a few slides, but the visual examples were amazingly rich there, so that was wonderful. What we want to do is move forward to um, participant questions so that you have the chance to ask people what they're doing. But I do just want to throw out that we've done our sort of, we did our initial webinar on um, simple, equitable, and engaging last week. Um, and then we did one for elementary educators and now this one for high school. Uh, starting on uh, next week, there will be a, just a 3.15 on Tuesday afternoons, EDT, um, online teaching Tuesdays, a drop-in. This would be for K-12 educators, for faculty, for 
for families, for anybody who has kind of questions about navigating this, we'll put up a, an ongoing webinar link for folks to join us on a regular rotating basis, ask questions, connect with each other, maybe even build some of that sort of professional learning network that, that David was talking about. Um, for now, I want to get to the questions that our panelists have. So I'm going to say thank you. Um, sorry, our que the questions that our participants have. So I'm going to say thank you to the panelists and to everybody for being here. And Dave Cormier, I'm going to flip it back to you and stop sharing. Right. So uh, we're going to go to Q&A mode, folks. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, please do drop them into Q&A. I am going to be your fearless uh, facilitator for this part of the process. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the easiest question, which is, um, what exactly are we doing about marking and testing? Uh, and that's, uh, it's the one that uh, I've been teaching faculty for the last couple of weeks at, the, at, at my institution and talking about their move to online and, and not faculty who we've normally taught, faculty who really hadn't considered this before three or four or five weeks ago. So the same as a lot of the people that we might be talking to now. Um, my first response, and I'll start, one is don't take our advice first. Talk to your people, talk to your principal, talk to your board, find out what the rules are inside of where your organization is. That's the thing that happens at the start of this conversation. Um, but once you get past that, and if you've got some flexibility or you've got um, some room inside of that conversation to make decisions, uh, the one thing I'll start out by saying is start by, by exercising the pedagogies of care, right? So any place in which you are thinking about the student first and how they're feeling about this, that's the way you address marking and testing. That would be after the board and principal guidelines, that would be what I would say first. So I think this is one of those questions that might just go around the, around the table, maybe talk a little bit about where you're at with this and maybe uh, what things are like in your situation. David, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so uh, I mean, we've got a, a little bit of guidelines from the Ministry about uh, assessment. I mean, uh, it, the good news for someone teaching uh, grade 9 to 11 is you can breathe easy for a little bit right now as there's no midterm marks required. Um, and for grade 12s, I think, you know, in our board, midterm marks are due tomorrow, but they're supposed to be just a mark. And, and I, agree, I agree with you, Dave, that you really have to really think with the student in mind. Um, and my focus right now would really be about just finding ways to get students to engage online and giving them opportunities to do things where you can give them constructive feedback and focus more on the learning as opposed to the assessing. And I think if you focus more on the learning, the assessing will come later. And as, as long as, you know, I, I know I've talked to a lot of teachers and they're very, very worried, especially a lot of math teachers are very worried about the integrity of their quote, test. And I'm, I'm just telling them, you know, just, you know, don't worry about that right now. Just worry about helping your students get through this material. You know already that it's going to be less material than it's going to be. It would have been in a face-to-face -face class. And uh, like, just like try to get them to be in, engaged in your classroom and get them to work on that first. The assessment part, I think, will fall out of that. And as long as you have, you keep in mind that you, you, you can try and triangulate your assessment, it doesn't always have to be a written test. Uh, okay. You can have conversations with your students and, and that can be part of your assessment. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, Behan, you answered this a little bit on the Q&A. Do you want to sort of elaborate on the, the points you made there? Sure. Um, I I uh, mentioned that it, it varies from board to board. Our school board at the TDSB is uh, using the pre-closure grade as the, um, as, the, as the grade that we're beginning with. And so students can improve if they, if they wish to, but they're not going to be penalized if they're not able to participate online. Um, and I think that the, you know, the, the distinction between um, assessment as learning versus assessment of learning is a really important one. And that's actually part of the, um, the policies around assessment practice. And doesn't, just because we're not assessing, um, we're not assessing for a grade doesn't mean we're not assessing the learning. And that's where the feedback piece is really important. Um, and the last thing I'll say is like, if you do have a board that uh, will, um, you know, penalize the student if they're unable to participate and you might 
you, it, and you know that being an inequitable, inequitable practice, I think there are ways that you can maybe use the flexibility you're afforded uh, and your professional judgment to really um, make um, decisions around uh, how you are going to frame assessment for your students and really focusing on process work rather than just, um, and I think Bonnie, you mentioned this in a previous session, just like, you know, just mastery, like just having, you know, a quiz or, um, or a test. There are ways that you can adjust your, um, your, your assess, your assignments so that it's a better reflective of, um, of a learner's needs. I think in all of our fields, there's the whole Bloom's taxonomy idea, right? And the more, particularly in this time, this is an opportunity to work as much as we can towards some of the higher order stuff and perhaps let some of the mastery stuff wait for a little while. Yeah, and it, yeah, at the end of the day, we've all got those pieces in our field also that we know are the absolute critical pieces. So Sandra, David and I- I'm sorry, I just wanted to hear from Sandra too after you're oh, done. I will, I will. David and I might argue about this, but in math, it's always been told to me that algebra is the keystone going forward. That's the place you've got to double down. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, I think we all know we have those pieces in our field that are critical. Sandra, why don't you tell us what's going on in your situation in terms of marking and assessment? Mm, well, we've been along um, a bit longer and originally we, um, were, we had to consider whether or not we were gonna do our third quarter report cards and we scaled that down significantly to just, um, we, we called it a reflection. In many cases, we were just looking at um, comments on digital learning and how students were doing in that in that space. So um, we, we did pare down in terms of what our focus was because originally our directive from the government was just review, nothing new. But then things changed as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months. And um, we, we didn't want students to lose out on um, the newer learning. So we did just tell teachers to pare down on a few standards and the assessment, um, one of the things many people started off doing was, you know, what they were used to, let's do tests, and trying to figure out how to put like a phone in the back to keep the integrity of the test. And it's, it's not very um, doable. So um, I think the key to remember, like, when we're always talking about assessments is a variety of assessments. You don't focus on one type of assessment. Um, a presentation or even a chat participation in, in a conversation or um, doing a, a video to explain their understanding of a math concept uh, or, or a science idea. All of that is still very valid and, and focusing on the formative as opposed to just this one high stake assessment at the very end is, is also very important. Um, and so that is something where, as we're moving towards the end of the year that we're focusing much more on, um, where uh, the, we're an IB school, our IB exams have been taken away, which is really great. Something that I think we should look to doing more often, even moving forward. Um, some of the takeaway we wanna learn from this whole experience. So then, what is a valid assessment that we can take away? What kind of portfolio do you want to show to demonstrate student learning? And I think some of those visible thinking routines to really dig into what students are actually thinking and learning um, can help guide you in all of that as well. So I think the follow-up question is, and it's in there three or four times in the Q&A, and I'm seeing it in the chat room as well, is, oh yeah, it's easy to say we're not going to use the testing, but how, this, how are we going to convince the students to learn? How are they going to get their work done? I mean, we've been threatening with tests for years. I'm not suggesting that's what was said in the chat room, but we've been threatening people with tests for years, let's face it. And the idea somehow, and I've heard this from the faculty that I'm working with the university too, well, if we don't have exams, nobody's gonna study. Nobody's gonna do any work unless I have something to threaten them with. So I know you guys presented some um, active sort of processes that are engaging already in, in all of your presentations. But if you had one piece of advice in terms of trying to encourage that engagement without threatening um, what would that look like and let's maybe we'll let Sandra keep going you can so you can go first this time mm, it, it definitely is I think I think of the Maslow hierarchy of need if you meet the students main needs 
um, then they're more likely to engage. So um, do they have access to be able to participate in the lesson? Um, if they don't, then they're not going to participate. So we've done a lot of calling up students to see what their home life is like uh, to really get an assessment of that, um, to have these one-on-one -on -one sessions where we would really get an idea of what's going on and what's their barrier. Um, and then once you have some of their basic needs met, um, then, then they're more able to engage. And, and I think we've had more participation on the more fun activities and much less participation on the activities that are just, uh, you know, listen to me talk about my lesson and um, content driven, those kind of things. So you want engagement, make it fun. Sorry, I lost my mute button there for a second. Behan, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a sense of uh, what you'd be doing to get students engaged without being able to threaten them? Um, I know that right now, I there are many teachers who don't have access to the really uh, strong, uh, strong courses that have been developed by experts that are uploaded in you know by the ministry that provide some of the structures that teachers are looking for. We are right now in a situation where we shouldn't be expecting students to engage in whatever we understand as traditional uh, learning. So I, I would sort of uh, encourage reflection about how, um, you know, how we are maybe sometimes confusing what we're doing right now with online learning when this, these are not the same things, for instance, I would say about 90% of the teachers in my school right now, they're up over a hundred, they're using Google Classroom. And I am using uh, Brightspace because that's where I have taught online for a decade. And I had asked Brightspace to upload really excellent material that I could use to deliver some, you know, activities. Um, but I'm not, you know, delivering activities that are requiring um, more, uh, sort of traditional assessments. So if, if, you know, if that, if that isn't convincing enough, I would say uh, deliver your quizzes, but ha if you want the reward, it's like you can, the student can get the answer right away and it shouldn't be included in their grade. So you still kind of can get the exercise of the quiz, but often it's helpful for students to get immediate feedback. And so if you can sort of bake those answers in and they can get that response right away, it can be a tool, um, a formative tool that can be really useful. David? Well, I was going to say immediate feedback, but thanks a lot for that, for taking that from me. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, this is a beast that we've created, this idea of we have to um, always assign a mark or else the kids won't be motivated to do stuff. And, and there's a lot of truth to that because, you know, that's what we've done forever. And that is what students expect. And that's what parents expect. But we know that as humans, we will learn anything that we want to learn. And we are living in an age right now where if there is something that we want to learn, we can probably find something online to help us learn that thing. The problem with school is most of the stuff that our kids um, are, we're asking our kids to learn, they don't, they don't care about. And so I think one of the things that we can do is we can help students uh, engage a little bit more by giving them more choice in our assessments and understand that we don't have to give everybody the exact same assessment to be assessing every student. Uh, so giving within an assessment, giving students choice will give them a little bit of aut autonomy where they can actually buy in a little bit more and may see, okay, I can do this because I can do these parts. And, and if you just structure those things well enough then, and even move towards a standards-based grading sort of uh, environment, then, you know, I think you, you can really help your students in that way. I, I just want to jump in and say that we're getting feedback if students aren't engaged, right? It may not be the feedback that we're looking for, but in a sense, we have had the school system operate in, in very structured ways for a long time. We're all accustomed to it. And perhaps this is a moment where we go, huh, maybe some of this isn't really working for learning, right? It may be working for education or schooling or some of the control compliance pieces. But if we're actually going to look at learning and that's all we can take in our hands right now, then we need to consider how that operates. And 
what part of that is, I think one of the messages that we've been trying to put out is keep your tools simple. Don't bombard people with 17 different tools because nobody can handle the cognitive load of that. But also somebody made a really excellent point in the chat about um, tools that allow for unlimited attempts by students to do things. If you're trying something new and you're not sure if it allows unlimited attempts, eh, maybe don't throw that in just yet till you have a chance to figure that out. Um, someone did a, a podcast with me yesterday and they said, well, what do you think about the fact that, you know, teachers are finding students going around all these assessments? And I said, those students are learning. They're learning the system that we're in and they are very much um, doing exactly the kind of critical cognitive work that I would hope they would be doing to try to figure out how to get around something that isn't engaging for them. Give them something that is engaging for them. I know that's easier said than done. I'm not trying to make light of, of the huge load that is on teachers right now. And I think teachers are doing a good job. But that's why simple matters. So I'm going to keep you going, Bonnie. I'm going to keep you going in that rhythm. One of the questions we've got at the bottom of the, uh, of the, bottom of the questions, and I really like, you've been doing online learning since the 90s? Is that true? Yeah. Right. right. Um, <laughs> so... How do you give, one of the things that we've been talking about with my courses, the university faculty, is how do you add a smile to the work that you're doing? So we normally give feedback to students on a, on a paper. We don't necessarily add the positive reinforcement when we do, like we grade an academic paper. And one of the things we've been saying is, the smiles you'd be giving people in classrooms are not smiles they're currently getting. So how do you give quality feedback and include the smile in the process? One of the things that I think is really important and difficult to see for folks who haven't spent a lot of social time online, and a number of our panelists brought it out, this is not just an instrumental space. You actually can build social presence in an online space. When I teach online, and I teach a lot in blended courses, so I do have often the privilege of meeting my students face to face as well, but my online communications are they have smiley faces in them. They have funny memes in them. They have a number of things in them that to someone who is more accustomed to very formal academic style um, communication might seem initially really off-putting and like, oh, they won't take me seriously if, if I engage this way. I've not had a problem with students taking me seriously, to be perfectly honest, but they take me as a human because I try to communicate with them using the tools that the online space allows for me to show my humanity. I'd love to hear from the other folks about other things that you're doing there. David? So in terms of showing my humanity, is that? <laughs> well, no, I'm not suggesting you don't have it. How do you show it in your feedback? Like, how do you give quality feedback in a humane, friendly way? You know, because I think sometimes people think of quality feedback as academic and cold and rigorous feedback, but how do you give that feedback and still like how do you give good online online feedback that way? I think that if as long as you you follow good pedagogy in the first place and focus on you know starting with the things that you like, um, that's always going to be a good in for students. You know uh, you know zero in on the things they did well and the things that show promise uh, before you start to look at things that that may be uh, you know problematic I think that you know and that's good whether you're in a face-to-face -face class or in an online class and so that really shouldn't be any different and I think the other thing is is make sure you're you're giving your students opportunities to check in with you as to you know how they are feeling about their work you know so even including a, a part of an assessment that is or uh, that is about you know how do you think you did on this tell me tell me why you know, so that you can get some insight in, in that way. I think that, it, that would be helpful. I'm gonna to try to squeeze a couple more questions in here. So I'm sorry for not letting Sandra and Behan weigh in on that. Sandra, you actually said that there's a question on the Q&A that you wanted to address. Do you wanna go ahead and address that one? Sorry, I, I pressed the button by mistake, <laughs> okay. but no problem. Um, the question was, uh, what about final assessments and, um, I haven't heard anything official yet. We actually, um, one of the things we started doing was, uh, um, we, do, we still do have some final assessments, uh, but what we're trying to remind teachers is use a variety of assessments, um, like what I said, um, 
we're, we're trying to dissuade teachers from using exams for sure, because it's just too complex and um, requires us to have to purchase software to keep the integrity. And, um, and even then we don't even know how, how software good an assessment, yeah, how good an assessment that really is. So as much as possible, um, you know, the model UN for us was a really good um, assessment tool because it was live, there was interaction, there, there was many nuances to that, um, that type of assessment, trying to do collaboration with other subject areas so that you can both um, look at components and make it a little bit more engaging. Um, and we, we really are trying to hone in on the formative assessment instead of the, the summative. So we as, uh, I mean, we're one school, one, not one large district. So it's more nimble than, um, than when you're in a district environment. But for us, we, we were able to say, you know, we're just gonna focus on formative this year and we're just gonna focus on these um, criteria and don't worry about these other ones. Um, so sure. that, Great. that was what we did. Great, Behan, I'm gonna ask you kind of a tricky question. Uh, you sort of spelled out the hours that you were teaching and did that reverse engineering question. And there's a question here that says, how many curriculum expectations do you try to hit each week? And I wonder if you can talk about how you shift your vision of curriculum expectations around the amount of time you actually have. Um, so I am throwing specific expectations out the window. Overall expectations only. I don't need students to get a variety of texts from different periods um, that are culturally specific or based on the Western canon. So they, you know, like they can't access these things. And I think that I, um, when we're thinking about oral communication and effectively conveying your tone and being, you know, not um, adjusting to your audience, I'm thinking about what my subject is going to impart for students to apply to the rest of, for the rest of their lives. And so I'm okay if we don't cover this on it and I'm okay if we don't, you know, cover um, the um, academic essay. I'm okay that we are going through maybe how they're going to craft an email. Um, and also I need to recognize and I think it's really important to mention, there are lots of students who are never going to make it online. Like there are students who have disappeared effectively. And it is really important to remember the context in which we are working. Um, it is fantastic to be able to run uh, really, really vibrant synchronous sessions. It's not possible in a number of schools in, in our district where students don't have access to um, the supports or even the, the immediate uh, home environment they're working in the front lines right now there are folks who are um, really under a lot of pressure so the discussion around like how we're delivering things right now during a crisis has to be distinct from what it might look like if we don't return to a full face-to-face -face class and we need to think about what we're how we're organizing our full courses um, you know once once we're beyond this um, em emergency moment perfect Bonnie and I just wanted to follow that up and say thank you for that message because that was actually from uh, one of my shout out uh, Bachelor of Education pre-service teacher students <laughs> who are working really, really hard to figure out what they have permission to consider in this moment, right? And one of the things that we're doing this for is to kind of put out that message of talk to your boards, you know, but you have permission to keep it simple because that's the only way to keep it equitable at all. Behan's point about students are disappearing. My kids are going to come through this and we're like, Dave and I are doing this half the day. They're not really getting great home learning guidance or project management from us. Believe me. You're getting a lot of <laughs> shh, get off the phone. We're on, we're on a web pass right now. Get it, stop watching Netflix. That's right. But, but that. those are, those are privileged kids, right? And, Many, many kids have a hundred different reasons why they're just not going to be present for these things. So when it comes to next year and kind of building into next year, expect to go back and start foundationally if we are all together again. That's got to be the case. John asked a really great question in the Q&A about um, sort of how, how do we navigate that big picture of the fact that everyone is going to be in different places. 
everyone's always been in different places in education. This amplifies that and exacerbates it. Um, I'm happy that our province chose to um, treat teachers like professionals and allow teachers and boards to make individual calls about what their students needed. But please, educators, remember that your students need you to not try to do it all so you look like the teacher who did it all. Because if you come out looking like the teacher who did it all, your students probably will have been left behind. Uh, that's a f great final note from you. How about one more from uh, everybody else around the room? So Sandra, what one final note for people, a last message? Um, I think I want to say take care of yourself. Um, I think when you're doing too much too, you're actually adding more stress to yourself and um, it, you, can't, you can't do everything. Beha? I, uh, was, I have a question that someone had asked in my mind where they said, you know, how, how do you sort of like reduce screen time with your kids? So I, my advice is don't worry about it. Like we are, I, again, my kids, I'm failing miserably at parenting this whole time. And I'm just going to have to, I'm just gonna have to manage. So my message is be compassionate with yourself, assume the best of your colleagues and, um, and students assume, don't assume the worst of um, anyone's intentions um, and be as compassionate as possible um, when, when, when filling in the gap between what you're seeing and what you don't know. David. Um, I think what's really important is that your kids somehow see that you are human here. Uh, you're not a robot at the other end of the at the other end of the computer. You know they can see that a lot in in, in your face to face classes, but make sure you give them uh, aspects of you that that show that you're human and that you are there for them uh, in any way that they need. Um, and my last note is just to try to sweep up a couple of questions in the chat room. Constant communication on regular timelines is a great idea, Steve. That sounds great. Soft timeline, soft deadlines make sense. In terms of people in grade 12 moving to university, the one thing I would encourage you for the fear that you have in that is that your students that you're talking about are 35 of about 30 million right now. Everybody's in exactly the same boat in terms of moving to university next year. So you're not going to be disadvantaging your kids because they're stuck in a pandemic everybody's stuck in a pandemic. So things will come. I mean, most students are going to be able to get into most universities based on grade 11 grades or midterm grades anyway. There are lots of ways around this process. Support people, make them feel cared for, make them feel loved as much as possible so that they come out of this mentally healthy and prepared to go to university. If there's anything you can do for them, that's going to be it. Bonnie, last word. Thanks very much, everybody, especially panelists, but participants as well for amazing questions. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to put the uh, recording of this session up. All of that emphasis on being human, being caring, send this out to your boards when the recording comes up. Um, maybe they can, <laughs> maybe people need to hear this at all levels of education. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you on Tuesdays. Cheers. <laughs>